All right, gentlemen, I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today. I am Tony Flock with Creative Leadership Solutions, and I'm pleased to be your moderator today as we learn about our instinctive emotional responses to COVID-19. Uh, you will have an opportunity to ask questions regarding how to offset those emo involuntary emotional responses and about how to care for yourselves and those around you. We invite you today to share your experiences and most importantly, hope that you will be able to connect with other educators for mutual support. So we are pleased today to bring you Live in Fragments No Longer, Only Connect. Uh, as we begin, just a couple of notes. Uh, all participants have been muted due to audience size. We certainly welcome and encourage your questions throughout the day, so please do not hesitate to use the question or chat features to interact with us. Um, Today's webinar is also being recorded and will be posted to our website shortly. Please feel free to download that recording in the future to share with any colleagues who are unable to attend today. And finally, the slides from today's presentation have been posted and are in the handouts section and available for you to download. With that in mind, I'd like to introduce first Dr. Douglas Reeves, founder of Creative Leadership Solutions. Dr. Reeves has worked with education, business, nonprofit, and government organizations throughout the world. He's the author of more than 30 books and over 100 articles in leadership and organizational effectiveness. He's been twice named to the Harvard University Distinguished Authors Series and was named the Brock International Laureate for his contributions to education. Dr. Reeves, uh, received both the Distinguished Service Award from the National Association of Secondary School Principals and the Parents' Choice Award for his writing for children and parents. His career of work in professional learning led to the Contribution to the Field Award from the National Staff Development Council. And for his international work, Dr. Reeves was named the William Walker Scholar by the Australian Council of Educational Leaders. His volunteer activities include finishthedissertation.org, providing free and non-commercial support for doctoral students, and the Snafu Review, publishing the essays, poetry, stories, and artwork of disabled veterans. Doug lives with his family in downtown Boston. He tweets at Douglas Reeves, blogs at creativeleadership.net, and may be reached at area code 781-710-963. Doug. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. David Gleason and uh, also just make a, a quick note that the webinars that we're offering for free around the world include not only the topics we're here today, but also support for assessment, for grading, excuse me, for feedback, and uh, oh my goodness, as well as for effective leadership and teaching in a virtual environment. Uh, please go to creativeleadership.net if we can provide support for you at the local, state, provincial, or national levels. Uh, Dr. David Gleason uh, is our speaker this afternoon. He is internationally recognized as an authority on, ad on adolescent development. Uh, his book, At What Cost, is widely used, and David personally has worked with students, parents, and faculty members around the globe, including schools in North and South America, Africa, Asia, and Europe. Uh, David, it's a great pleasure to have you here this afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me. So, as a, my primary work, hello everybody um, and welcome and thank you for coming to this webinar. I hope that some of what I have to share is helpful to you uh, in trying to understand and contextualize uh, your own, perhaps your family's and colleagues' uh, emotional responses to what's happening around the world with this pandemic. My primary work um, is in adolescent psychology and particularly within adolescent neuropsychology. So I have had and still have a fascination with the intricacy and the exquisite nature of the developing human brain. Um, so when this all began to occur, I was immediately aware of my own cycling feelings, um, up and down feelings, feelings that I've heard some people say it's like low tide and high tide all at the same time. Um, and I was immediately reminded of a book that many of you might recognize. Uh, it was a seminal piece of work back in 1996 by Daniel Goleman called Emotional Intelligence. Um, 
the term EQ then became quite popular uh, to, in a sense, um, compete with the term IQ. Um, anyway, in that book, uh, Goleman coined a phrase, amygdala hijack, which is what I'd like to suggest is what's happening worldwide. Um, amygdala hijack is defined by Dan Goleman as, right here, a personal emotional response that is immediate, overwhelming, and out of measure with the actual stimulus because it has triggered a much more significant emotional threat. The primary purpose, the primary issue with the amygdala hijack is it triggers the body's intricate, if not exquisite response to stress, which as many of you know, is the fight, flight, or freeze response. So ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna begin the presentation today with a poll, uh, ask you to take out your cell phones uh, and prepare to send a text using poll everywhere. What we'd like for you to do is send a text to recipient 22333, the number on your screen there. So you're texting to the recipient 22333. Once you get that addressed, please type the message creative lead 764. Leave that up for just a moment. I'll uh, give you a chance to access that poll. Again, please address your text to recipient 22333 and type in the message creative lead 764 and hit send. All right, that number will remain at the top of the screen in case you are catching up or like me at the end of a slow internet connection. So again, please send a text to the number 22333 and enter the message creative lead. The question that we would like you to respond to today to begin is what symptoms or signs of stress are you seeing in your colleagues, students, or yourself? Uh, you, can, you may choose any of the answers that you see on the screen and you may send up to three responses. Uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Pretty equal distribution there. Mm -hmm. All right, and we'll leave that up for just a moment longer. Good news so far, Dr. Gleason. I don't see anybody that is feeling angry. Yeah, not yet. <laughs> All right, so a few more responses trickling in, but Dr. Gleason, Doug, would you care to comment on the results that we're seeing here? Well, um, I expected, as I'm seeing anxiety, anxious to be uh, among the front runners, and um, I am in fact right. Um, I've also experienced lots of people uh, being unmotivated, feeling, um, you know, kind of, um, kind of um, the effect of having having less scheduled, less routined lives have left them feeling lost um, and having lost a sense of what their usual life routines have been. So that has often contributed to a sense of feeling unmotivated. Um, but look at anxiety continues to uh, rank right out there uh, as highest and that's that's certainly been my experience, and it's been the experience of many of my friends and very very close colleagues as well. Doug, do you want to comment on that? Um, y yes, I would just add the following: that uh, it's really important that when our adolescents are not checking in, uh, I've heard a lot of frustration by teachers and administrators. Well, they they just don't show up, they don't participate, they're not answering their phone. Let us not fill in that silence with assumption. Maybe yeah. we should fill in that silence with some of the alternatives that you see on the screen before you here, because yeah. if the issue is anxiety, a feeling like I'm a failure, or chronic depression, that may explain why they're disengaged from electronic learning, and let's not leap to the assumption that they're just lazy adolescents who are not paying attention. That's exactly right. 
Yeah, this what this what this slide also shows us is the um, you know the the varying amounts of feelings. As I as I mentioned earlier, I had a woman this morning describe her experiences as going from high tide to low tide. Um, I've done another webinar on how the stages of grief uh, that a Kubler Ross uh, initiated back in 1969 seem to apply now. Um, and a lot of those stages, even though they were presented in a linear fashion, people don't experience them in linear ways. Uh, and quite like this, um, I'm not assuming that anybody who who clicked anxious and isolated and unmotivated is are or is only experiencing those feelings, but I'm guessing that uh, many, if not most people on this webinar are experiencing varying degrees of every one of these feelings uh, at different times throughout the day and throughout their weeks. So thank you for this very valuable information. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. Yes, sir, should be coming up shortly. So this brings me to, um, to kind of the neurobiology of, of what's going on here. Particularly, I'm going to focus on the anxiety role because it was so high. Um, but when we get anxious, um, our bodies are, and our nervous systems are, are beautifully hardwired um, from an instinctual um, you know, perspective to keep us alive. So it has something called the autonomic nervous system, which has two completely separate and counteracting branches to it. The first one I want to talk about is the sympathetic nervous system, the primary purpose of which is to stimulate this fight, flight, or freeze response during any potential danger. It automatically and immediately increases our heart rates. It also sends adrenaline uh, from the heart throughout the entire body, throughout the rest of the nervous system, to provide energy to respond to any of the perceived dangers, to provide ways that we're, we might, might actually fight, flight, or freeze. It also um, decreases the peristaltic movement in our digestive system because in a time of threat, we don't need to digest. Um, we need to uh, put as much energy as we can into protecting ourselves with fight, flight, or freeze. One way to think about this is um, the, the sympathetic nervous system is the gas pedal. Um, and when chronic low stress level keeps going, the gas pedal stays activated uh, like a motor that is idling too high or for too long. And my sense is that right now, many of us are experiencing a kind of um, chronically high idle in terms of our own stress level. Uh, where the gas pedal of our sympathetic nervous system uh, hasn't let up, it just remains on. In contrast, in complete contrast to the autonomic, to the parasympathetic, excuse me, to the sympathetic nervous system is the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, the parasympathetic nervous system has a primary purpose to in inhibit the body from overworking and to restore itself to a calm and a composed state. What it does in contrast to the sympathetic nervous system is it decreases heart rate. It also in, um, stimulates muscle relaxation that calms the body down after the danger has passed. Part of what's happening now is that the danger hasn't passed yet. We all see a danger. We, we feel a danger. Our body's telling us there's a danger, but we can't see it, um, but we know it's out there. So our sympathetic nervous system has remained active, which means that this relaxation um, is much harder to activate. In contrast to the sympathetic nervous system that, that minimized um, the digestive uh, process, now, the parasympathetic nervous system has often been responded to as the rest and digest system. The system returns to normal and our bodies muscularly become rest, rest more rested and we can digest um, accordingly. Using the car analogy again, think of the parasympathetic nervous system as the brake. Uh, because when it naturally happens, it naturally dampens the stress response and returns our bodies to a state of normal functioning. So keep in mind, when stressors are always present, as they are for us now, 
we constantly feel threatened. The fight, flight, or freeze reaction stays turned on. Consequently, long-term activation of the stress response system results in overexposure for many of us to cortisol and to other stress hormones that put us at increased risk of prolonged anxiety, depression, and to associated challenges with maladaptive coping behaviors, such as the possibilities of self-harm, alcohol and drug abuse, reactive hostility and aggression, and so on. Doug, thoughts, responses, questions for David? Let me defer to our audience first. What questions have you had come in over the transom? Great. Ladies and gentlemen, please take a few moments and uh, take the next 30 seconds and send your questions in for David uh, at this point, and then we'll pick up from there. And Tony, your voice is kind of breaking up in and out, so be as close to the microphone as you can. Um, yes, sir. So, David, I think one thing that our, our audience really, uh, particularly educators and parents, are interested in is um, even if we understand why uh, students are kind of self-isolating and withdrawn, uh, mm -hmm. the temptation will be for us to say, come on, snap out of it. Right. Uh, what are some, uh, where do we need to be patient and where do we need to be encouraging? Yeah. Um, I think the first place to be patient is in validating, first of all, um, you know, the, the adults who are probably witnessing these kinds of experiences with their students or with their uh, children are also themselves feeling these kinds of um, cycling experiences emotionally. So it's most important, I think, to validate. Um, one of the things that I keep saying, validate the children's feelings, validate the students' feelings, and recognize that they are cyclical. Not one of them lasts all day, but they may experience several of them, you know, in a cycling kind of way. One of the things that I keep also saying um, is that all of us, all of us are in uncharted territory now emotionally around the world. There isn't an expert on the planet who has been through this kind of um, long-term pandemic. Um, so we turn to thought leaders, we turn to research, we turn to what we know. But it's important for adults, be they educators or parents, to recognize that um, responses like snap out of it simply won't work. Uh, we have to validate their experiences um, and recognize that they too are in uncharted territory. So I would just add one more thing, David. But, uh, go ahead, I, I'm Doug. sorry, Tom. Please go ahead. So, some questions that have come in. Uh, what suggestions can we give to students in addition to validating their responses, as you just shared, David? What else can we give to students? Um, you know, uh, I'm going to address that question uh, in some future slides. So, I wonder if we can hold off um, until we get to kind of what what to do next. Uh, because okay. what I what I have for suggestions applies not just to students but also to uh, educators and parents alike. So a clarifying question: uh, Students, people who are already considered emotionally disturbed with these symptoms, do these conditions, these reactions, just make the their issues worse? It's a good question. Um, I think students who are already struggling with significant emotional and behavioral challenges. Um, may or may not have the same level of understanding about what's actually going on. Um, but I, I think it's fair to assume that these students too are going to experience some kind of elevated um, uh, experience of their own emotional um, dysregulation. Um, part of what's going to cause that and part of what's going to be re reactive to that is the adults around them are also experiencing um, kind of an emotional dysregulation, an emotional um, lack of control, and that that will be much more easily perceived by students who are already struggling with emotional and behavioral problems. Quite frankly, when kids are struggling in emotional and behavioral ways, uh, they, have, um, they're, they're, they have like antenna. They can sense when the adults around them 
are not um, feeling stable or are not feeling control. So, um, and they're reactive to the adults' um, dispositions. They look to the adults to be uh, leaders or to be anchors in terms of their own emotional regulation. So I can imagine not only that the, the pandemic itself um, contributes to an elevated sense of, of difficulty emotionally, but it also means that the adults whose primary role, be they educators or parents, uh, may be to, to help regulate those children, are themselves feeling um, a, a lack of regulation for the, and that that's likely to agitate um, that very dynamic between the children and the adults themselves. All right, and final question before we continue with the content. Are stressors the same as love languages? <laughs> um, I don't think I know enough about, um, I've heard the term love languages in reference to a book about 10 years ago, but I don't think I have enough information to answer that. Um, I, but whoever answered, whoever asked me, I'd be, I'd be welcome to um, engage in a conversation or an email exchange after the webinar because I'd love to know more about what uh, is meant by that. Excellent, thank you very much. All right, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, please keep those questions and comments coming in. We will pause again shortly to uh, respond to the next set. All right, back to you, sir. Thank you. So with this next slide, uh, the first thing I want to do is invite you into a, just a, a demonstration kind of activity to try to make a point. Um, you can all probably see my hand. I've just raised my right hand and my fist is, is clenched. When I say go, I'm gonna invite all of you to do that too, to raise either your right or left hand, it doesn't matter, and to make a fist. When I say go, I will count to 10, and I, as I make that count to 10, I'm gonna ask you to squeeze your fingers as tightly as you possibly can so that it is as tense and as tense as possible in your fist. And then after that, I'll say release, and then you'll slowly just let your fingers come out and see what happens. So let's try that. Ready? Go. One, two, three, four, five, six, very tight, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now just slowly open your fingers and release. And you can probably feel the blood flow gradually back into your fingers as a state of, in a, in a sense, a state of calm or relaxation returns to your hand. Um, what I want to make the point about is this. With that basic demonstration with those muscles in our fist, in our arm, those muscles react the exact same way that muscles throughout our entire body react. It is this. It is physiologically impossible to be both tense and relaxed at the same time. The tension that we're experiencing is coming from a hyperactive parasympathetic nervous system that hasn't yet been able to engage fully um, with its parasympathetic nervous system to calm it or to calm us down. But it's important to recognize that it is physiologically impossible to be both tense and relaxed at the same time. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as uh, relates to some of the questions you've already sent in, we're going to begin to talk about some ways to respond to stress in the next section of our content. However, we'd like to hear from you first. Our first poll is going to ask you what steps you, your students and colleagues are taking to cope with stress. A quick reminder of the polling directions. You, If you texted in before, you should still be available there. If you have just joined us, please send a text to recipient 22333 and type the message creative lead 764. Those that have already joined, you'll uh, see the question in just a moment and be able to respond to that. Those that are just joining us, please take a moment on your phone to send a text to recipient 22333. Type the message creative lead 764. And our question, uh, please respond to this using short phrases or words. 
what steps are your students and colleagues taking to cope with stress? What are you all doing right now as you try to address the stress? And we'll give you about a minute to reply to that. The text is a little small, ladies and gentlemen, so I apologize. I will read these off as they come in. Circling the wagons, exercise, talking to others. This can apply to people on the call too, not just to students and colleagues, but to individuals on the call. Walking in nature, connecting with friends, uh, positive messages to teachers, positive messages, sleeping. Uh, that's my 15 year old daughter. Mm. Mindful breathing, mm. taking mm. a walk, mm. tears, walking, mm. talking, counseling, mm. eating. Mm. I've heard the COVID-20 referred to, David. Yeah. Breathing and physical yeah. activity, professional growth via audio books, midday breaks, music, writing letters to friends and family, getting outside whenever possible. Communicating mm. more with others. Keeping a routine. Mm. Praying. Mm. A gratitude journal. Intriguing. These are these are beautiful responses. Students get brain breaks through Go Noodle built into the virtual curriculum. Time outside. Taking it slow. Move uh, our high school's weight room to my garage. Group text messages with departments. <laughs> nice. Meditation, cooking. And ladies and gentlemen, we'll leave this up about another 20 seconds. Uh, and a comment came in. Someone was unable to connect to the poll. So Zoom happy hours with friends. Mm -hmm. uh, alcohol, cooking. Mm -hmm. uh, Zoom pictures meeting, exercise, cooking, spending time with family, mindfulness, yoga, art. Art. And ladies and gentlemen, we're going to close this poll in just a moment, but please keep the responses coming in. We will share those after the fact. Hugging my cats. Mm -hmm. Pets. Alcoholic beverages got another vote. And weekly student TV program, uh, highlighting student contributions, organizing and cleaning. All right, David, Doug, uh, if you'd care to respond, I'll leave this up uh, if you all have any comments while, so we keep seeing this scroll through. I would just add ahead, one Doug. thing that I'm seeing around the country and that is um, some really encouraging uh, signs where students are kind of getting outside of themselves. Uh, I think with good intention, some schools are treating students as, as helpless victims when a better thing for their emotional health is to have them feel valued and purposeful. So I'm seeing efforts to have students, for example, I saw a middle school put on a talent show where every kid in the school had a few seconds to show some sort of talent, some silly, some serious, uh, but they were getting outside of themselves and sharing with each other. I've seen high school students do kind of like you see in the late, late night programs, 12 students do a musical ensemble, all from different places on Zoom and uh, and playing uh, playing songs for their, for their friends, uh, poetry slams, artwork, um, I've seen adolescents reading to younger kids over the phone, uh, checking in on elders. In other words, the whole point is uh, we we need you, your community needs you, and you are a valuable person who has meaning during this crisis. Thank you, Doug. That's very consistent with my uh, next round of slides, too, to go through this. I want to just, um, if we can progress to the next slide, that'd be helpful. and should be coming up momentarily. One other comment that came in from someone unable to connect, uh, scheduling Google Meets just to check in and chat. And then I'll turn it back to you, Dave. Excellent, thank you. So one of the, uh, one of the, um, one of the ways that we try to address the issue that the parasympathetic nervous system isn't um, kicking in on its own because it's still, reacting, if you will, with a parasympathetic nervous response, is to do what we call autonomic nervous system regulation. Uh, in the field, it's called ANS regulation. Uh, it refers to personal self-care to actually stimulate a parasympathetic activation. So um, I have to say that all of the responses that just came in from the recent poll are consistent with what ANS regulation actually means. Some of it is very intentional, others 
is whatever it is that brings people to a calm state. Uh, as many people on the poll already indicated, uh, they use regular exercise. I want to just mention that regular exercise results in both physiological and psychological adaptations in the human body. Specifically, um, exercise is associated with lower sympathetic nervous system reactivity, so it lowers the sympathetic nervous system's reactivity level, but it also stimulates parasympathetic functioning, which is anti-anxiety effects. So exercise, while not a panacea, is one of the strongest um, ways to activate, to stimulate on your own, your own parasympathetic activation. I saw lots of people taking walks and exercising in various ways and walking in the, in the woods and being outside in nature. And these are all, these are all uh, parasympathetic activating uh, responses. Um, another cluster of responses that came in uh, talked about relaxation techniques such as mindfulness, meditation, and yoga, and breathing. I just want to emphasize that each of these kinds of, of mindful meditation um, uh, responses turns on the opposite of the fight, flight, or freeze response. In this next um, item, um, I mention apps such as Headspace or Calm or 10% Happier for guided meditations on a wide variety of topics. I mention that because very often in, in highly anxious situations, when we, try to, um, when we try to meditate, when we try to bring our mind to a sense of calm and stillness, because of the constant anxiety, uh, it's not uncommon for our minds to wander and to, uh, in a sense, get more anxious in a quiet state of mindfulness, which is why I can I think that guided meditations that are available in these in these apps such as I use Headspace all the time, Headspace and Calm and 10% Happier. There are many of them available, but having a guided meditation means that the pressure is kind of taken off of you, and is is uh, you're allowed to follow along with an expert's ability to guide you into a state of calmness. Um, other ANS regulation techniques involve taking time for hobbies, and I, I saw that people were doing that as well. Um, let me just mention things like reading uh, and listening and playing to music, listening to or playing music, doing puzzles, gardening, photography, cooking, writing, drawing, chess. Um, my wife and I have been playing a, month, a weekly game of cribbage with a couple with whom we've we've reconnected. We realized that we could have been doing this for the last 30 years, but now in a pandemic mode, we're playing cribbage uh, virtually uh, by Zoom. Um, and perhaps most importantly, and I heard many of you saying this too on your polls, uh, foster and maintain healthy social connections. Uh, you'll recall that the title of this entire webinar was called Live in Fragments No Longer, Only Connect. That has become somewhat of a motto for me in my own presentations. As I've been presenting about my book around the world, um, the term only connect really to me fosters a sense of empathy, fosters a sense of connecting with individuals and with each other for the purpose of social and emotional support. And in this time of social distancing and sheltering in place, I can't think of anything more important than connecting with individuals by Zoom, by phone, however, by, by letter, by email, by any way possible to foster and maintain the closest possible connections you have. To follow up on something that Doug just mentioned in terms of uh, getting outside yourselves, um, volunteering in your community is an incredibly important um, consideration. I, I listed this one website. There are many, 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 but you can search for online volunteer opportunities. This one, www.goldencarers.com, um, pairs volunteers with elderly people in uh, nursing home facilities or in um, assisted living facilities uh, to read aloud to them virtually. Many of these people in these kinds of facilities 
have read their entire lives, but perhaps because of their own health status or their own whatever might be going on in, in the pandemic situation now, they're not able to read. Um, so Golden Carers pairs people virtually with uh, reading aloud to uh, people in assisted living or in nursing home conditions. It's a nice way to develop a relationship and to provide an incredibly useful way to help uh, even these older people calm down. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that if, if all of these attempts that you have to try to stimulate your own parasympathetic regulation don't work and the anxiety persists, I think in terms of intensity and the duration of these conditions. If the intensity of your anxiety or of your colleagues or of your students or of your children's anxiety um, remains high and it persists for a long period of time, um, don't wait to seek professional help uh, to get um, to get some added assistance on that. There might be medications that could be helpful. Uh, there could be more specific kinds of behavioral therapies that are available, and everything's available now on, on a telehealth basis. So we have some other, what I think of our practical tips. Um, some of these things came up uh, in the poll uh, just a little while ago. Um, that establishing routines. Um, I want to add to that, that not only is the idea that routine is your friend, but particularly in this time uh, where so many people's lives have been, been upended and their daily routines have gone kind of out the window, uh, as you plan your next day, it's it's really been advised to plan your next day the night before. Because if you wake up in the morning and you don't have a kind of schedule set for yourself, it only adds to the feelings of sadness or the feelings of depression or the feelings of anxiety about not having a structured day to lead you. So as much as possible, plan your next day the night before. It could be that you plan the next day uh, with you know, intentional meetings by Zoom, be they professional or social, um, with, all, with taking a walk, um, with cooking, with whatever might be the activities that are going to fill the time of your day. But the idea here is simply not just to have a routine, but to do as much as possible to plan your day the night before. On this next one, um, I add this one because I find it to be and have found it for a long time to be an incredibly valuable way to structure my own time, my own days, and my own weeks. You might recall a book from um, a long time ago, Stephen Covey wrote a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. After a several years, Stephen Covey merged with a company called the Franklin Planner, and they developed this, um, this planning system that was grounded in articulating first your own values and your own uh, principles uh, and your own mission statements. And as part of that, um, they developed this thing called this roles and goals planning technique. The idea here is this, that each of us plays several, if not many roles in our lives. So for example, uh, I am a psychologist, that's my professional role. Uh, I'm also a husband. I'm also a father of three adult children. I'm also a close friend to fr friends and neighbors nearby. I'm also a cousin. I'm also a sibling to my, to my three siblings. All of these are roles that we play in our lives. And one of the things that I've always found helpful about this, it's kind of a holdover uh, that I've tried to maintain, is that I think of the roles that I play in my life and then on a weekly or monthly basis, um, but you can do it on any time basis you want. I try to set goals within each of those roles. So for example, as a psychologist, I might set a goal to write an article or to write a blog post. Uh, as a husband, I might set a goal to go out of my way in some way to be supportive or kind or thoughtful or to do something uh, for my wife that I wouldn't have thought of uh, naturally. 
um, as a sibling, I might reach out to them by email or I might invite them to a, a Zoom cocktail party um, to celebrate. My sister's um, birthday is coming up and we're going to have a, a, a Zoom gathering together. Um, you know, as a, as a father, I might reach out to each of my three children in certain ways with specific goals in mind. Um, the idea here is that you're spreading out your, your structure and it's less just about trying to fill your time with activities and hobbies, but you actually are reaching out to people who are in your life and kind of like volunteering, you can make a big difference in people's lives, which in fact has a reverse technique, a reverse effect of making a big difference in yours as well. The next one I like just because it just makes sense um, to try to say or do three kind things each day. The idea here, kind of like what I was just talking about in roles and goals, is that altruism um, reduces stress. It actually activates our own parasympathetic responses. It also induces feelings of happiness. We tend to feel happy when we do something kind for someone else. Um, it also builds and strengthens the personal connections that we have. And quite frankly, it models generosity and we always need more of that. Some other practical tips include this one called Vital Friends. This takes a little bit of explanation. Vital, Friend is in, is in, Vital Friends is the name of a book um, by a guy named Tom, oh, I'm forgetting his last name right now, um, who, um, who actually, it's Tom, Rapp. Tom uh, yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. What he actually wrapped, Yes, thank you, Doug. Um, Tom interviewed, he reviewed more than 8 million interviews from Gallup's worldwide database. 8 million interviews. And found that people who have a best friend at work are seven times more likely to be engaged in their jobs or their work. I mentioned this because it just, it just emphasizes, it highlights the significance of we bring our whole selves to our jobs. We bring our whole selves to work. We don't just bring a, a professional self. We bring who we are. We bring what happened to us last night to our jobs. We bring what's happening to us now. We bring whatever struggles or, or joys we have in our lives. We bring everything with us when we go to work. And having friends at work means that we get to share some of those things. And the more likely we are to do that, the more likely we are to bring our whole authentic selves into our work and be more authentically engaged in it. The next one is something called check-ins. I'm taking the term check-ins from another book that I find incredibly valuable. Um, called An Everyone Culture, uh, Becoming a Deliberately Developmental Organization by one of my own mentors and friends, Robert Keegan, and his colleague, Lisa Leahy. Uh, Check-ins uh, are, are taking a few minutes before any professional meeting, and we can do this, I've already done it several times on Zoom, but before any professional meeting to do check-ins with each other, to kind of go around the meeting and say, so how's everybody doing now? Of course, uh, participation is voluntary and what people share is also completely uh, up to them. But what I found in doing these kinds of check-ins before a professional meeting, whether it's a, a department meeting of some kind, um, is that it allows people to, um, again, to share a little bit more about who they are right now, about what's going on in their own lives, particularly at this time of sheltering in place and social distancing, where these kinds of normal connections would happen. Um, adding check-ins uh, or even check-outs as well to these meetings allows people to be recognized not just as a means to an end, not just a math teacher who's expected to uh, teach this curriculum, or not just as, as a department head who's expected to manage this department uh, of, of business details for the department. Of course those are parts of what's going on, but adding check-ins to meetings means that Participants in all of these departments are are valued as human beings, uh, as being uh, experiencing their own challenges, their own struggles, and as as being invited to bring, in a sense, their whole self to the job before they actually get the job done. 
So finally, on this one, um, I also like to suggest that people schedule meetings, you know, every few days or every week. What's most important here is that meetings are done consistently and predictably. In times of crisis, um, consistency and predictability um, basically create routine and make and create feelings of safety and security. So I recommend whatever meetings you're you're ordinarily doing, do them consistently uh, and do them predictably. And if anything, as I write here in yellow, err on the side of over communicating, just for regular social touch points. I think that so brings ladies us and gentlemen, to again, please. Keep your questions and comments coming in. Uh, David, a couple that have come in was a request to share the uh, book titles that you reference. So, ladies and gentlemen, we'll follow up and make sure that that's available uh, mm -hmm. to you either on our website or if you'd like to email me, tony.flock, F L A C H, at creativeleadership.net, or Dr. Gleason's email address will be posted momentarily. Uh, the question came in, David, uh, our staff meetings have 75 plus teachers. Mm. Um, any check-ins that we could do for a group that large? What are your thoughts? Mm. Um, I would encourage, I've, I've been in meetings that have been that large. And uh, while I've encouraged, I've encouraged check-ins um, or some kind of sharing, but not everybody because that would, kind of take over the entire meeting. But quite frankly, when we've had check-ins from even a sampling of people, um, it conveys a sense of, of concern for everybody. It invites anybody who wants to share anything with the whole group uh, to do so. And my experience has been that when there's been a sampling you know, of, of six or eight people who have shared something, what they have shared has often uh, been reflected in what everybody else is experiencing too. So there's a general sense of we're all in this together. Um, but I think some some basic check-in to the, to the meeting still makes sense, even if it's to get some representative sampling of the group, not necessarily the entire group. And this is Doug, I would just add that that's really essential for uh, virtual classes as well. Uh, we may have 30 or 35 kids in a virtual class, I favor the use of equity sticks. Uh, in other words, don't wait for volunteers. Everybody has an equal opportunity to be called upon. If they're not comfortable sharing, they can nominate a friend. But that way, uh, we're not cherry picking just to the happy talk. We're willing to hear the challenges and the fears as well as what's working well. And I think that sort of use of equity stick helps every student be engaged. Uh, That's excellent. You typically see that at the elementary level, but I, I'm encouraging my colleagues in middle and high school to use it as well. Mm, it's fabulous. David, an additional question that came in uh, said, thinking about your practical tips, if my baseline personality is that I let myself get distracted by maybe not as vital a task as I really need to address, which of the tips do you think would be the best for me to really concentrate on? Mm. Um, hard to say. I, I, I guess I would encourage trying to establish routine. Um, um you know one of the one of the effects of being kind of uh, unmotivated or anxious or frustrated or struggling with these kinds of emotions is um it's really easy for us to procrastinate things that we should get done um i would recommend trying to break things down into smaller pieces trying to make a commitment to, you know, whether it's a, um, a project you're supposed to work on or it's a paper you're supposed to write or it's some, some activity that's being expected of you, um, you may not, it might feel like it's too much to, to try to accomplish it all in one day, but you might feel a tremendous sense of um, beginning uh, some momentum. I think it was Lao Tzu who said, you know, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And uh, sometimes that single step is the hardest one to take. But once taken, it adds to a feeling of a little bit of achievement, a little bit of I did it, um, and it's more likely that you'll take a second and third step and so on. So I would encourage trying to break things down into more manageable uh, bite-sized kinds of pieces of work. Uh, and I'd also strongly encourage trying to, uh, as I said earlier, establish some routine. All right, thank you, sir. 
David, what what wise counsel? Because I think sometimes we lurch into all or nothing thinking. If I can't write my novel or read War and Peace, then I've been a failure during the pandemic. And I heard yeah. a, a wonderful Princeton uh, professor of Russian literature say, reading War and Peace is a great objective, but 15 pages a day, that's yeah. it. Then, <laughs> that's exactly then you can give right. yourself permission to, to goof off for a little bit. That's exactly right. Yes, indeed. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your questions and comments. Uh, closing comments, Doug. Uh, well, first of all, my deep thanks to, to Dr. Gleason. Uh, this has been so helpful for me as a parent as well as for me as a colleague. Uh, you're right, we all play different roles, and this has been very insightful to help me try to be a, a better parent, spouse, and leader. Uh, I would also uh, like to suggest to our audience that uh, my colleagues are providing free webinars on a variety of different subjects, not only on emotional health with Dr. Gleason. Dr. Kate Anderson Foley has been providing free webinars on special education needs, um, and we've also been providing free webinars on things like grading and feedback in a virtual environment, as well as how do we prioritize standards and curriculum and get ready for, it's gonna come here sooner than we think, the 2021 school year. So if those services are a valuable uh, a value to you, your state, your province, your region, uh, please let us know and we'll be very happy to support you. Thank you. All right. And as a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, this webinar has been recorded and once compiled will be posted to our website. Dr. Gleason's email address is on the screen there. Please continue the conversation with him and with us. And Doug and David, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Have a great afternoon, everyone.